join us, let's get right to it. It's good to see you, Chris. Good to see you. All right, sounds good. Why are you here today? Why have you agreed to do this interview? I haven't seen you do too many. Uh, this is actually the first thing I said yes to uh, when I decided that I would um, talk, I guess. Um, and it's because I miss being around journalists and the opportunity to be in a conversation with either those in the business or who want to be in the business. Um, that seemed like, a, you know, there were different opportunities, bigger venues, whatever, but not being able to really have an intimate conversation with the future of the business and those who are able to affect change now. What's the importance of sitting before journalists and really getting an opportunity to express yourself before them? You want to, when you think about the kind of message that you want to disseminate to a journalist audience, what would that be at this particular moment in time? No matter, look, this industry is in massive disruption. I don't you know, need to say that. But no matter the solution, no matter what platform, no matter what the way forward is, it begins with the people in this room. It, be it begins with the people that are on the ground getting actual information and facts um, that the greater public has a hunger for. So while there's a lot of talk about monetization and different platforms, it, none of it happens unless you've got actual journalists doing the work, and that, that's what people here are, are here to talk about. So we, that, we, that's why it's important. When we think about legacy media, typically conventional media, that's what everybody knows about legacy media in this day and age. In your eyes, has it deteriorated, and if so, why? I can tell you that it is an indisputable fact that trust in our business is at an all-time low. And just when you think it can't get worse, it does. Um, I think we saw that at uh, election night. Consecutive four-year drop, according to the report right in front of you. Right. Um, so that's an indisputable fact, and I think you have to look at why. And there has to be a lot of self-reflection as to why. Because the audience has decided that they are going to go someplace else to get their information, and frankly, to get their opinion. So what is it that we're not doing? What is it that we stopped doing? And it's a really complicated answer. When someone says you're fake news, that is not why people don't trust you. It's that that person has tapped into a feeling. It's not coming out of thin air. So yes, that is not fair, and people shouldn't be saying that, but why is it resonating? And you've got to look deeper and say, okay, what are what are the what are the reasons that people have stopped trusting us because they have for the most part. Well, what about those who would argue that when such an assertion or an accusation is made, whereas it shouldn't be made with a broad brush, it should be specified to a degree. Nevertheless, there is still some truth to it because you do have people who have platforms, local, national, etc., that disseminate whatever their belief is as opposed to it being the truth. But some of what they say actually happens to be true. How do you dissect or differentiate between the two situations? I think you've hit on the, I think the core problem, and that is that facts, news and information, facts, the things that people in this room go and cover, have commingled with opinion. And people don't see the difference. And when you're in these institutions, you go, well, of course, they know the difference between this and, and you know, no, the, I, I believe people just, they want to know what's happening and they want a trusted voice and that has migrated to people who do not have, in many cases, the same guardrails, right? So they'll just say things because it'll get clicks, it'll get ratings, it'll get views. So we have got to return to one set of facts that everyone can agree upon. And then a bunch of it, a bunch of opinions around those facts, not what we have right now, which is a hundred sets of facts and a thousand opinions. Well, who do you blame for that? And, here's, and I'll preface, I'll preface that by saying this: there is a clear distinction. For example, if I'm watching Jake Tapper on CNN, that should be a clear difference from Abby Phillips or Caitlin Collins in front time. If I'm watching Neil Cavuto on Fox News, that's not Sean Hannity or Jesse Waters. If I'm watching, you know, uh, you know, the news in the afternoon on MSNBC, that's entirely different than Joy Reid 
for someone on the lines. It's clear that it's more opinion than it is actual news. Nevertheless, you're sitting here, you're saying it's convoluted to some degree. There's not a clear distinction, or these people are not comprehending that. Why would that be the case? Because I think you watch more than the average person out there. And I think, look, one of the things I've done with my time is I've learned how to become a pilot. Mm -hmm. And I did that largely because I wanted to really get outside the bubble and meet people that have nothing to do with media. Mm -hmm. One of the friends that I've met has a plane. And a month ago he said, hey, come down with me to North Carolina so we can help with hurricane relief. Mm -hmm. And I went, we flew into Statesville, North Carolina, picked up 1,300 pounds of supplies, brought it to Ash County. It was amazing, bunch of volunteers, hundreds of people, not a, not a FEMA worker to be seen, okay. okay? And then I talked to a county commissioner and he says, you know what, we think FEMA's gonna get here by the end of the week. They were a little bit uh, caught flat-footed, but they're, you know, it's gonna be okay. Now, we all know how that was covered. You have some people saying FEMA's given away all their money to the migrants and they've completely abandoned North Carolina because they hate North Carolina. And then you have the administration going, no, everything's perfect. We're on it, we're on top of it, we're there, we, we're doing this, that, and the other thing. And I believe the press, in a, in a good-hearted way of trying to disprove the lie that FEMA is not doing anything, takes the view that everything's perfect. And they give voice to everything's perfect. And if I'm a guy sitting in North Carolina, that is not my reality. So if you're seeing something that isn't your reality, you then tune it out. And you say, I, you're not relevant in my life. And I think that's what happens when you do not have a agreed upon truth that everybody trusts. And I think that's been eroded by the fact that opinion has mixed into all hours of the day. And it's not, it, you have to be a very close watcher of these things to go, oh no, I know the difference between Joy Reid and something and Chris Chance. I would push back by saying, whereas I'd say nothing to argue with the point that you just made. I think the advent of social media, the fact that an inordinate amount of people have such a profound voice, or at least they feel that they do, and everybody has a voice, and everybody gets to be heard, at least in the crevices of their own mind. When you look at back in the day, the Ted Koppel, the Peter Jennings, the Tom Brokaw, the Dan Rattles of the world, and others of uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, et cetera, some people felt like what they were talking about back then had nothing to do with their reality but it still didn't have the level of vitriol, mm -hmm. the level of, of, of disgust that we see expressed in this day and age. How do you explain that, because I can make the argument that it was always the case when people, when people felt like reporters and journalists weren't necessarily reporting on things that they deemed relatable to them, but they still didn't act the way that they're acting now. Because I think what, what happened back then mm -hmm is news divisions weren't expected to make money. Okay. So you felt that even if it wasn't relevant in your life, you were being given information because it was important, not because it was gonna rate. Mm -hmm. And all of that, hey, look, I, people snicker when I talk about the importance of the breaking news ban, right. okay? The breaking news ban, if everything is breaking news, then nothing is breaking. And every time that you put a breaking news banner up over something that isn't breaking news, you're undercutting trust with the audience. Because they're like, oh, you're reporting that because you want me to watch, or you want me to click, or you want me to get outraged. So all of these things erode trust. And so even if it wasn't relevant back then, you still had trust in it because it was done for pure reasons. This is what's important. Now, and that was, a, I would argue, a community. People had a community around, I want to know what's happening, I will go watch the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. That's why he was the most trusted man in America, right? Now what you're talking about is that community has shifted to different voices that people are seeking in the absence of what used to be the purview of mainstream media. And the people that are able to build communities are the ones that are seeing success in media right now. And how do you build those communities? And at what cost do you build those communities? If you're just feeding people 
things that are at, as fact that are not as fact to build those audiences and communities, that's not good for society. And where we sit right now, and I cannot be more alarmist than this, we are living in a low trust society. And low trust societies ultimately fail. So the notion of getting trust back into institutionalized journalism is, there's nothing more important. And so all of this feeds into that problem. Was that your mission? To elevate the level of trust when you took the job at CNN? Yeah. I mean, remember, I left the greatest job in the world. I had 12, week off, 12 weeks off a year. I worked with Stephen Colbert. We made jokes. I didn't, I'm not funny at all. But it was like, we had a, I had a good gig, and by the way, Stephen Colbert is one of those people, like, if you call me outside of business hours, someone better be dead. Like, he, he was not someone who was always on the phone. So, why would I leave? Why did you leave? Because it was a calling. Because I'm a journalist at heart, and, and, and you have got to, you know, I'm not here saying that trust has fallen. It is a demonstrable fact. It is a measurable fact that we have lost the people. So if I could be helpful in that, that's why I took the job. And that's what the mission was, is to, can I help restore that trust? Can I be part of that solution? How did you feel when David Zaslow, obviously Warner Brothers Discovery, your former boss, uh, made the decision to move on from you after bringing you on board, knowing what your mission is, swearing it was his mission, and yet after 13 months decided to go on it? What was that moment like for you? Um, it was business. Um, that's how I felt. I felt um, anytime that there was bad press about me, my first reaction was always, this is not fair to the people of CNN. There are thousands of people at that organization that come to work every day and don't give a shit about any of this. They want to do the job that's their call. You know? Journalists, by and large, do not get into the business for fame, fortune, money. They, they do it for truth you know? There's people in this room who've made enormous sacrifices to get to the truth. I'm looking at Shimon, I'm looking at Vaughn. So, in as much as headlines about me were a bad experience for those people, that made me feel bad. And if uh, moving on from me without that, it was business. So look, I'm still friends with him, we still talk. I would imagine we may be in business again. So um, I looked at it as, as, as business. I think when people look at you and you know, one of the at least it's a tenet that I hold near and dear to my heart as a journalist is that, you know what, be as objective as you can possibly be, but when you're going to be subjective, be honest about it so the audience knows you're being subjective. So I'm sitting here today interviewing this man because I've gotten to know this man and I have profound respect for you and the talent that you are and what you bring to the business and I think you're missed and I can't wait to see you back in it in full throttle. Having said that, I'd be remiss in neglecting to ask this question as you sit next to me right now. People would like to know, why do you believe you were let go? Was it the town hall with uh, Donald Trump, former president, now president-elect? Was it the piece that came out in the Atlantic a month later in June of 2023, days before you were let go? If you had to pinpoint anything as to why you believe you will let go that you want the world to know, what would that be? When you try to change something dramatically, you, you can't do it alone. You've got to build the, build the trust of the organization. They have to believe in you. And I did not build that trust. I was not able to, in the time that I was there, build trust 
so that people would tune out the noise and sort of follow me into that? Because of time or because of something else? Um, I think, I know I've thought a lot about this. Um, time is an element of it. Um, we have to remember where things were at that time. It was, it was a crazy, I think everyone could objectively say it was a crazy time, particularly at that organization. But that, I'm not letting myself off though. Um, I think when you try to have a bold way of going forward, you have to be confident, and you have to show confidence in it so people follow you. But there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance, and I still work on dialing that. And I think sometimes uh, I was on the wrong side of that. Um, the Atlantic article, I absolutely should not have done. Uh, speaking of arrogance, imagine saying yes, after, by the way, saying no several times. But at the end, saying yes, because you know what? When this comes out in a year, I will have saved everything. This is gonna be an article that's gonna be so positive because in a year, I did it. Imagine that arrogance now that I look back. Now, I hadn't failed at anything before, so it was, I absolutely thought, you know what? Yeah, in a year, they're gonna be writing about, wow, look at all these great things that have happened. Um, so no, I shouldn't have done that. Definitely should not have taken the report to the gym. <laughs> if I can say one thing to anybody, do not bring a reporter to the gym. Um, the Trump Town Hall, I, um, I said at the time, and I still believe today, it was the right thing to do. I think it's been borne out by you know, what happened in the election. Um, I also said at the time that we probably could have done a better job of telling the audience at home who was in that audience. Um, you know, the team at CNN, they've done 100 plus of those. How they choose the audience, all, all of that, like, they, there's no one better. And nothing changed for that, for that event. And you know, I think their reaction, remember, we hadn't seen Trump for a very long time. That was the first time he answered very tough questions uh, in a long time. And the fact that his shtick resonated with voters in New Hampshire, that's part of the story. But people at home had to be told that. And that's one thing I would have done differently. But so why was it? I think it's all of that. And I think it's, it's uh, people that, there are those that didn't want change. And how I reacted to those people, you know, I picked some fights I shouldn't have picked. Uh, there's some things I should, some alliances I should have built. There are people I should have trusted more. There's people I should have trusted less. Uh, but, you know, there's not a leader in any organization that doesn't have those self reflect Last question on this subject. Okay. Tell me when you said the reporter. Promise. Give it a promise. You get a reporter uh, access. I mean, it's a personal question. I, my own education. What kind of access exactly did you give this person, and for how long? I mean, I, I mean, it was, it was a pretty extensive piece, and you were talking about a year from now. I look. I, I thought I would look this way. How much access exactly did you give them? If you, you want to say don't give a reporter this kind of access, what kind of access are you saying? Do not give a reporter ever again. Tell us that. <laughs> By the way, not as much as you would imagine. Okay. Okay. Not as much as you would imagine. It sounded like a lot. It sounded like. Right. Um, not you know, look. I think we sat down four times oh, over right. So it was not. This was not like he was tagging along with me for uh, for a year. Uh, but I think you would not have asked that question again had he not come to the gym. Mm. And by the way, that was going to be, hey, day in the life. It's right. amazing. He starts at 6 in the morning in the gym, and then he goes and does this. And then, but yeah, that's not yes. how it goes. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, you know, look, there are things I said in that piece, um, in all seriousness, that I absolutely believed, mm -hmm. and probably caused me more problems than looking like an asshole in the gym. But I believe those things. Probably not the right forum to express them. So that, like, um, I, I don't know that I want to be at a journalism conference and say don't talk to journalists. But, <laughs> but no, I'll take them to the gym. No, I'll take it to the gym. <laughs> I'm watching the election unfold. Mm. Really a couple weeks ago, and uh, 
kind of one this question. And knowing you, coming to know you the way that I have, I found myself thinking about you a lot. I felt that, in a way, you were vindicated. You came to CNN. You wanted change. The mandate was changed because too, too, too far on one side. You wanted centralized to some degree, a little bit more objectivity, et cetera, et cetera, because the voters, the potential voters, were being turned off. And we were told, no, 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 that is not the case. Life has changed. The left and progressive tendencies and what have you, we're all for it, and it will show come election night. And it didn't. Instead, what happened were the kind of things you had articulated in terms of the voters being out there, what they really wanted, their ability, their, their ability to feel attached to certain things. Did you feel somewhat vindicated on election night in terms of being connected to what the audience was telling you they wanted? I'm not talking about Trump. I'm not talking about politicians. I'm talking about the mindset of the voters and what they were saying they wanted and what they were looking for. You seem to have more of an attachment to that than people realized at the time that you were at the helm of CNN. Did you feel a little vindicated on election night? After election? I felt reassured that I was with. Um, but I'm not a lone voice out there. There are many people who when I got the job, articulated that same thing. So, um, I do not, vindicated would be feeling that no one was listening to you, and you were this lone voice that everyone said was crazy. And I never felt that. I felt always that there was this large undercurrent of this is a problem, and it has to get fixed. And the rub is how do you fix it? But I don't know that there are, um, vindication is the wrong word, I think, reassured that um, maybe more people will see it now. Um, but th there's just not a, this, th this, is, this is an actual issue that now seems a little more crystallized. So if people see it now, leaning towards your words reassured, and we see a former president that now is coming into office again, and he has the Senate and the House. How should networks be covering <coughs> politics now compared to how they've been covering it in light of what we've seen transpire with this election? In as much as it will have impact, of which I worry, I, I, I worry that. Um, some of the influence that legacy media has enjoyed has really eroded to the point where what I'm about to say may not matter. Okay. But in as much as it matters, I think swing at pitches that are thrown. And that means don't try to predict what's going to happen. The media gets into trouble when it tries to predict. This happened, so that means this. A comedian made a bad joke at Madison Square Garden about Puerto Rico. That means Latinos are going to do this. You don't know. Report on the joke. Report on what happened. Report on the cabinet pick. Do not try to extrapolate what that means. I have to challenge you. Well, wait a second. Wait a minute. Okay. Go ahead. The press, the people that cover things, the people that are trusted for news and information, gotcha. do not try to extrapolate what that's going to mean. Totally understand. That's the job for people like you. Right, but that's what I'm saying. Because those people that are reporting, and I've, and I've often said this to people, this is how I maneuvered from <coughs> being in newspapers and radio, ultimately television, and doing what I do as a commentator, I'm a beat writer for the Philadelphia 76ers, covering Allen Iverson and the 76ers and those guys. 
And it's 2001, and they make a run to the finals. And even though I knew Kobe and Shaq were going to take them out in five, I called them, <laughs> right? I said, I'm covering the, the, the team, and I remember breaking every single story about the Sixers that year. And come the playoffs and the finals, I was reduced to being limited to an 800 word a day article because investigators, department, the features department, and everybody else in between came in because we've got to build subscribers, build subscribers, all of this other stuff. And they're throwing all of that in. And the news didn't matter for five, more than five seconds. Because once you got it, all you wanted to hear was what people thought about it. How do you talk to an abundance of aspiring journalists recognizing the fact that news is paramount. It's very, very important. That's the foundation upon which this industry is built upon. But it pales in comparison in terms of significance to the opinions that follow, because that's what the audience is interested in. What do you say to a bunch of aspiring journalists about how to maneuver their way through that terrain? I mean, that's the reality. Which part of the ledger you want to be on? Mm -hmm. You got to make that choice. And I said, look, I, one of the things I did also, I taught up at Syracuse University, future of media. One of my students is here. I don't know the future of media. I mean, it was a, like I'm asking, hey, what's the future of media? <laughs> um, but you, I had students in that class that go, I want to be an influencer. I want to, get, I want to talk about what's happening in the world because I have something to say. Great. And I had students in that class that said, I want to be the person that goes and finds out what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to get away from thinking you can do both. You've got to be one or the other, and organizations have to really delineate between those two things. Mm -hmm. And I think the future, Right now, everyone has kind of gravitated toward the commentary because it, it suggests that, oh, I'm in a community. There's others that think like me. And that's what people, people want to feel like they're not alone, especially during scary times. But what actually happened, truth about what actually happened is going to become a commodity. It's going to be scarce. And those that are able to report on what's actually happened in a way that has credibility with everybody, that's going to be the future. I don't know how that actually looks or in what form, but there will always be a need for then interpreting that and saying, here's how I feel. And by the way, I've taken these four actual things that have happened, and I believe that means this. That will never go away. There will always be a place for MSNBC and monetized? Fox. But that, that part is easily monetized. The part that's hard to monetize is in, in, a, in a traditional business model is going out and covering these stories. It takes a lot of money, it takes resources. And to your point, it's like, you know, people don't want the broccoli or they don't want to pay for the broccoli. They, they want the cookie. So there will be a business model, and I, I'm literally working with people who are working on this, that finds a way to monetize that. And it is not through a traditional ecosystem now where advertisers pay for eyeballs. I think, I think there are some really interesting things happening that will, the best analogy I can use is anyone that's ever lived in San Francisco maybe in 2002, 2003, and tried to get a taxi, it wasn't a thing. You'd call the number, it'd be busy. Like Your friend might have the back number that no one has. And then you'd call and you'd get like some really angry dispatcher and they would send you this horrible car, maybe it would get there, maybe it wouldn't. Everybody hated the taxi experience. It was not giving people what they wanted. Then came Uber. And Uber, all of a sudden on your phone, you pressed a button and there was the car and it was a beautiful car and you didn't need that taxi system at all. And I'm telling you, someone is going to do to the media ecosystem what Uber did to the taxi system. I think one could argue it already has it. Mm -hmm. For the news and information part of it. Okay, the news and information part of it, fair enough, but ultimately, the news and information part of things, I don't know if you can live off of that, because again, once you have it, 
it's in seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you feel about it? What's your perspective on it? Because people want you to take a side, especially in this day and age. They don't, they, they don't want to hear neutrality. They don't want to hear that you have a feeling about nothing because they no longer believe that. So as a result of that, let's say, for example, you have a situation Fox News gets excoriated by a lot of people. Well, my response to that would be, fair enough. Why are they continuously number one? They have a larger audience than CNN or MSNBC or News Nation, for example. Why is that? And more importantly for you, as a direct question, what does that mean? Because obviously it doesn't mean that they're always right and everybody else is always wrong. But if they have the largest audience, there's a believability factor that is believed to come associated with ratings. If you have higher ratings than everybody else, if everybody's watching you as opposed to watching mm -hmm. your competition, the belief is you're the place to go. Um, look, I think Fox has tapped into something that some people in the podcast world have also smartly tapped into. People like Barry Weiss have tapped into. It's not, and this is, I'm kind of alone in thinking, it's, it's not really a right, you know, right of center. It's not really about that. It's about questioning groupthink and saying, you know what? This story isn't exactly as you think it is. And there are parts of it that aren't being reported. They've tapped into that, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. But I think people, because they've lost trust in the legacy information, news and information, they don't think they're getting the full story. And they go to places that they think will give the full story. And I think one way, going back to your earlier question about how you can fix that, is if you are a news commentator, and you are interviewing somebody whose worldview you agree with, double down on the tough questions. You become, your side is better if you take tough questions. And I think too often we see interviews on the air with people that will, you know, of course, of course this is the right thing, and you just sort of let the person talk and you say, thanks for being with us. And if someone comes on whose worldview you disagree with, or whose cause you disagree with, You've got some very tough questions for that person. But I think we have gone down a road, particularly with left-leaning ideas, that are not challenged enough. And if you don't challenge them, then people out there who are watching go, you're not, I'm not getting the full story, I'm gonna go somewhere where I can get the full story. Well, what about this notion of her, uh, as, as it pertains to what is hurt the left? You have an opposite point of view than folks that lean right. And you're so vitriolic in what you've expressed that that may have compromised you. I bring up Morning Joe, Joe Scarborough, and Mika Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. um, they went to Mar-a-Lago to visit with Trump. No issue there. But he is the same guy you call the racist. But by the way, people do have an issue with him. Right. <laughs> Which I think is absurd. Yeah. I don't have an issue with them going to see them, but I do have an issue with if you called him a racist, but did you tell him that when you saw him to his face? Or did you apologize? Did you, when you compared him with Nazis, did you look him in the face and say, I stand by that? Or did you fess up and say, I apologize? But here's the biggest issue I have. The biggest issue I have is no matter what side you took, no matter what position you expressed in, did you tell the audience? Because you told the audience what you felt about him. Did you tell the audience what you said to him when you met him face to face? I think the audience has an uh, has a right to know that from you because of the issue that you brought up about trust. You're not trusting the channel. You're trusting that person. I work for ESPN, but I'm Stephen A. I'm held accountable for what I do. If Mike Greenberg or you know, Troy Aikman or some or L. Duncan or somebody at ESPN says something, I'm not held accountable for that. I'm not held accountable for my words. And so for me, the individual who spewed that, are you standing on it or are you not? And did you tell your audience? I think that plays a role in it. Right, but what about the notion that 
there needs to be, and I think Mika said this, there needs to be a different way forward. Because all of that that you're talking about didn't, didn't work, didn't serve the audience, didn't serve our democracy. And if they're big enough to go, you know what, we have to, we have to reset here and we've got to start fresh. I don't understand why you want a virtue signal and get on television and then we told them this and we said this. But do you know them? I don't think I don't. Th I don't think they went down. <laughs> um, I think they recognize pragmatically that it's time for a new way forward. And look, they're paying a price in the ratings now. Is that because all of MSNBC is now? I don't know. But I promise you, they don't give a shit. They don't want to keep that rating number at the expense of of, of not being authentic. And if they, and I, I believe that they authentically want a fresh start. And whatever happened down there that allows for a fresh start and going forward on the air, you, you're transparent, I think, I think that's all you need. I don't think you need to do that. But we're allowed to disagree. Yeah, we do. Okay. And the reason why we do is because I think that when we talk about the importance of trust, in order for your audience to trust you, they need to know what your position is, and they're going to trust your position when it's displayed under adverse circumstances. If I'm sitting here alone with Chris Lick, and I'm smiling in his face, and I'm saying one thing, but then in a public platform, I'm a completely different person. And they become aware of that, that's a problem. But if the consistency is there no matter what, what I say behind your back, I'm willing to say in front of your face, what I said to my audience, I also made sure to articulate to him directly. Well, then there's a level of trust that comes with that. And as far as I'm concerned, this conversation about legacy media really, really comes down to regaining trust. How do you so regain trust? And being authentic is absolutely there you true. Go. And I think they I think, I think they authentically want to reset. Mm. So with that being said, as we sit here right now in November, right before Thanksgiving, 2024. Legacy media is not dead in your eyes. Is it on a respirator? <laughs> is, it, is it alive and well and just needs to be tweaked? How would you describe it? It's safe of a fix, that is. I think legacy media in its current form is does not have a sustainable future. Um, but to those in the room that do this for a living or who want to do this for a living, I am incredibly hopeful for you. Because there is a hunger in this country for the stuff that you guys do, which is report and get to the facts. And again, I look at two people who I know very well in this audience. And the amount of time that Vaughn Hilliard spends on the road actually getting to know Trump voters, and then actively waving his hand saying, guys, this is different, this is a thing. And I look at Shimon, who I gave a lot of money so that he could stay in Uvalde, Texas and cover what happened in that school and give voice to a community that had no voice and was really getting screwed and overlooked. And that's the kind of reporting that people in this country want. Once it gets back to headquarters and you throw the banners on it and you throw the teases and it's gotta you know, have this amount of time, and that's where we're losing trust. So your work is gonna be on that new Uber that has found a way to monetize what we're doing. I don't know that it's gonna look like what it looks like right now. I don't think it can. I don't know that these organizations are able to, around the margins, change. I don't know. I'm not saying they can. I think that there will be a tipping point where someone, and there are people who are making money doing what I've just said, in small scale, right? whether it's covering uh, local government, 
where there's a need for that information. You know, there's people that need actual facts and we're willing to pay for that, you know? Um, so it's all, it, there, there are a lot of people out there that I'm talking to every day. One of the things I've done with my time off is I have gone out and just spoken to people to find out where this business is I going. I can attest to that. So 200, 280 meetings I have had because I keep track of them. And there are people doing really cool stuff, some of whom I'm working with. And someone's going to pull all of these things together and it's going to turn into what the future is. I don't know that it is exactly as it appears now. My last question before we take questions would be that of a personal one to you. What role will you anticipate playing in all of this? Because trust is important to you, news is important to you, facts are important to you, but I will remind everybody that prior to going to CNN, you know, I mean, the entertainment side of Stephen Colbert and pretty damn successful leaving late night, transforming late night to some degree, because he became a bit more political once you took over. It became okay. more authentic. Okay. And that's, you know, that's how you... But that's what I mean, I'm just talking about focusing yeah. on politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's all I'm out there. But I'm saying, we, 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 I mean, because you can you can go either way, and either way you go, you're going to have, it's anticipated, you'll have a profound impact. Um, do, you, do you want, like, the right answer? Or the, the... <laughs> we want the truth. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we want. The truth is, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> uh, but uh, the honest answer is, I will end up where I can be helped. And that could be I, two or three things. You know, I get really excited when I talk to people that are working on this, that have, that have said, I'm, I'm throwing away everything and I'm going full force into this, and can you help me? Sure. Um, and someone, one of the biggest writers in Hollywood calls, hey, can you produce this movie? Sure. So I'm developing that. That seems fun. Right. Um, I might do something that'll get announced soon that'll be kind of fun, but like, isn't that the next thing I'm gonna do? I don't know. All I can do is get out there and talk to as many people as I can to figure out where this business is going, and there will be an intersection as to where someone feels that I can be helped. And if I can be helpful, and it can be with people that I like, and in something I believe with in, that's what I'll do. I enjoyed it. It was great. Thank you. It's a great question, and I think, first of all, do not shy away from commentary you disagree with. Invite it, double down on it. Uh, too often we hear these stories on college campuses of how could you even have these people come speak, right? And I think the New York Times got into some trouble when they, in their commentary section, you know, wavered on that a little bit. I would say invite everybody, but you gotta start with the truth. So you cannot come on and have a commentary about something that isn't true. At Stephen Colbert, we had an entire department, an entire research department of people I had stolen from CNN to do nothing but fact check the monologue. Think about that. Because Stephen rightly believed that a joke is meaningless if it's not based in fact. 
So I don't know another late night show that had its monologue fact checked. And that's, you know, I, I think that could be extrapolated to, to commentary. But you are the best in the business when it comes to commentary, but it's always based in fact. And I would love to hear what you think. Well, you're absolutely right. It's got to be based in fact. But it also has to be associated with fearlessness. You have to understand that as journalists, you're not here to be friends. You're not here for somebody to hug you and sing kumbaya and talk to you about how wonderful you are. You can't give a damn about that. Mm -hmm. Not at the expense of the truth. You can couch it in a fashion that shows it's not personal, that you're not trying to be disrespectful um, and create clickbait with incendiary commentary. But you have to be factual. And at that particular moment in time, the issue that he brought up is something that I embrace every single day, which is adverse opinions, things that differ from what I may feel or whatever. It's literally what I do five days a week. And I love it. I'm of the mindset, everybody that knows me knows. I roll up on television every day. I don't care if you're an NFL player, if you're an NBA player, if you, if you're a baseball player, I don't care if you're a Hall of Famer, or you're a scrub, I don't care what it is. My attitude is, you're going up against me, good luck. Because I'm gonna be ready. Because somewhere along the line, you're going to try to mesh facts with your emotions, and ultimately that might lead towards you embellishing a bit. And I got you. Because I know it was what I was waiting for. Like a lot of times when people are debating me, their attitude is they want to throw it all out there. And I, it's like bait. I just reel them in. Because if I go first, I'm not giving you all of it. I'm giving you a little bit of it. Just to bait you in. And then I'm happy. <laughs> and I know that. But again, it's based on fact, and it's based on a level of fearlessness because I'm not thinking about you as much as I'm thinking about the audience that's out there and their insatiable appetite for something as close to the truth as they could possibly get. And I owe that to them. And I'm not running for anything, which is why I was all over the Democratic nominee, Kamala Harris, initially. I didn't want to hear about her getting on the, ele on the election trail, on the campaign trail later. I don't want to hear that. At the end of the day, you were vice president for three and a half years. What you hiding from interviews for? Get out there, make your position known, tell them what you stand on, and why. And if it's factual, what are you scared? What are you scared for? And I think that the level of fear that she showed, hesitancy, whether it was her or her campaign or whatever, I think lent itself towards being something that was damaging to her because people were questioning where you stood. And it was a bunch of piranhas on the other side waiting for her. And she played right into their hands. Because they were like, hey, what are you doing? Trump did that. Debate tactic. What did he say? Cold tropes and all of this other stuff. What did he do? It's a war in Ukraine and Russia. Israeli Palestinian conflict. That's going on. I'm here. Where's she at? Now, he didn't say it. But what he was saying was, I'm a man, and I'm ready to fight for the American people. She's hiding. She ain't ready, y'all. That's what he was doing. And it worked for a whole lot of people. Hope I answered your question. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm a recent graduate of journalism school, and so you know, we've been talking a lot about objectivity, um, gaining trust in viewers, and I don't mean to be combative, but I guess I'm curious, you know, we talked about the Trump town hall. Um, I'm also, you know, curious about the decision to, when you were at CNN, hire John Miller as chief of um, law enforcement and intel as the analyst, kind of knowing he worked for the NYPD and had previously testified that there was no surveillance um, of Muslim communities since 9-11, things like this. I, I guess some frustration I've had with legacy media as a new journalist is the sense that these choices aren't necessarily a choice for objectivity, but a choice to come off as objective to a wider audience and to have a perception of objectivity over actually centering truth. 
And I guess I'd be curious to hear your response to that and justification for some of those choices. So uh, what in particular about the Trump Town Hall? I would say, you know, ha like get, giving him, I mean, it's, it's obvious that he has such support. He, he's gotten such a large percentage of the popular vote, but, you know, the way the town hall went down, the way the audience responded, the sense that it was giving him a platform to spread lies, I, I just guess I, I feel like there's a role in the news to also push back and to tell the truth and to stand up to those in power, not just to platform them. Do you think the Trump town hall plat just platformed him and let him just spout out lies, or did you have a journalist on stage with them challenging every one of those lies? And I, because I, I think um, that might be what some outlets do the, in a friendly interview, but I, I would say you, you cannot cover things with a concern about the outcome or how people are going to perceive it. He is and has been shown to be He's president, and you had to show where the country was, and more importantly, where New Hampshire Republican and independent voters were, and they were buying his shtick. And we, so like, you may not like it, you may think that it's bad, but if we didn't do that town hall, do you think there would be any difference, or do you think we would understand him a little bit more? And I would, I would, I would say that the, I, I would say, the electorate was more informed as to what they were getting from him through that town hall because we had not seen him for a while. First of all, that was a very authentic and professional answer to her question. Secondly, however, I'm going to say this for two reasons. Number one, because I have to go real soon because I have to catch a flight to Los Angeles. I only got time for a few more questions, but I really, really wanted to answer this question because I think it's important for an inspiring journalist like yourself to understand. You have to get over the fact that people are going to fly to you. As a journalist, every day, they're going to lie. Every day. I don't care where you go. I don't care who you talk to. They're going to lie to you. And oh, by the way, what made Trump special? Trump would tell you the sky is orange when it was blue. And you could look up and see it was blue. He got it to a point where you would make, you would wonder, am I colorblind? <laughs> is there something wrong with my eyes? Let me go to the ophthalmologist and check myself out because I know that I'm looking at the sky and the sky says this. He didn't care. And so when you say, and you ask Chris about, in terms of it's not really about the truth person, you know, it should be, but it's about convincing folks. I'm sorry if I'm misquoting you, but I'm just trying to make the point that I sit back and most journalists sit back recognizing that our job is to ask the right questions and present the facts as we know them to be. Not to force you to answer the way we want you to answer. Sometimes those lies that somebody is willing to tell, you expose them because you knew, you, you knew what the truth was and you presented it with your question. And as a result, the audience knows and they know that they're lying and that's all you can do. If somebody's going to sit back and say, I'm not telling you the truth no matter what you say, there's nothing you can do other than reveal they're refusing to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, right over here. Hi, my name is Carrie. I teach uh, journalism and communications here at Fordham and have a long career, a long career working in journalism. I almost worked for Chris. Uh, we took over the early show and I decided to go to Yahoo News. I, um, I, I, I have one specific, or really two specific questions, but I just want to first say that I was one of the few journalists who agreed with you, Chris, about the Trump um, town hall. And I remember emailing with some of my friends who are in the business and said, I can't believe you put him on. I said, but people have to see who Trump is. How do they know? How do they decide? And how do you get the truth if you don't have discussion? Right? There has to be an airing of what people think. So I just wanted to make that point that I actually did agree with you um, in that. But my question is, because this really stood out to me where you said you hadn't failed before. And that's wow, right? <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm working on that arrogance and confidence. <laughs> that's a, you know, so that struck me. Um, I didn't say that. But, so really two things is that 
I, my sense is that it would be really helpful for students and also for people like me who have failed, right? So the two questions are, one, what did you learn about yourself and the failure? And then two, um, how do you navigate failure? How do you get back up? I mean, you clearly stayed, you clearly continued to move forward and did things you were interested in, like the flying, the talking to the journalist, what have you. Um, but just talking through that process, my thought is that that will be helpful to everyone here. So those two questions. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I, I, I learned I learned you can't do anything on your own. You really need, you really need a good team around you. Um, and you need to, you know, I, one of my friends is here who, who's, who spent a lot of time trying to tell me things I didn't want to hear. And I was a little, um, I was not able to accept those facts. Um, and again, it goes back to that arrogance and confidence thing. Um, but as far as getting back up, well, what's the choice? You know, particularly when you know my kids are here, my wife is here. Yeah, people fail, and there's a lot of reasons. And what are you going to learn from it? How are you going to be better? How are you going to come out of it as someone who can take away a lesson? so that you're stronger and better. And to me, there was no other option. Even if you're failing in front of everybody? Especially if you fail in front of everybody, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, check. Um, <laughs> and, and I think um, this has been, you know, look, when it happened, there were people that said to me, it's the best thing that ever happened to you, and I go, <laughs> But it is, because it's allowed me to take a deep breath, which I had never done, and go, what did I do wrong? Not what did, what did people do to me? What did I do wrong, and how can I be better? And that is a, I don't even have that answer yet. That is a, that is a constant journey, and that's what I try to model for my kids, which is I'm not sitting around at the table, this person, this, and hey, boys, there's some ways that I could be better and modeling that behavior. So it's, thank you for that question. It's been, uh, it's been a journey. We have time for one more? One more. I do. One more. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name's Andrew. I'm a senior at Fordham, and I write for our paper, and I also work for our radio station. But I'm curious, specifically because my interests are in broadcast, what type of new media have you seen has success driving engagement traffic and profitability and monetization of your experience in the sweet C suite and Stephen of your experience being a personality. Um anyone who is able to build a community and like and, and, and what's so important is that media itself needs to build a community. Interest in facts and truth needs to build a community. We need America to root again for the press. Not personalities necessarily, but the press. And make that a community. That is the way that you get engagement and thus traffic and all of the things we're talking about. But from a standpoint, who's, what's working right now are people that can, like Stephen Ed, has a community. There are people who will take something that happens, and look, in sports, it's, it's much easier, right? The Steelers won, the Steelers lost. Daniel Jones is the quarterback, he's not the quarterback. What does Stephen A think? And if you find yourself, for those of you that want to get into the commentary space, you got to have some people that go, this thing happened, what do you think? What do you think this means? And the people that are successful in building that community, and I look at people like Barry Weiss, who are, who have very short time, built an incredible community. If you're able to do that, that, that is where the money is right now. And the trick will be, can down the middle reporting and facts and truth build that kind of community? Um, I think there's a hunger for it, someone just has to do it the right way. What do you think? I, mean, you, I don't disagree with there's you. There's no one better than you. I, 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 I appreciate that. There would, listen. 
all of that's important. <clears throat> and all of that's relevant because obviously you've got to build a community. You have to resonate. Uh, because people have options. And they have things, they have various outlets to do what they want to do with their time. Um, when we think about linear television and this dissipation that's been taking place with five every eyes, it's not because people are not watching content. It's because people are watching content in various other places that have been offered to them in the digital stratosphere. Um, and as a result of that, it's to their convenience. I've often leaned on the history of young folks to ask executives, why y'all acting surprised? To me, any parent can relate to what's transpiring within linear television and beyond right now. Young kids, what are they known to do? They want what they want, when they want, how they want, and they don't want to answer for anybody for it. So how does that relate to linear television? Well, I don't want to watch First Take at 10 o'clock. I want to watch it at 12 noon. I don't want to watch it on a big screen. I want to watch it on my iPad. I don't want to wait for the re-air. I want to just be able to punch it up, and I want to watch the re-air when I want to watch it. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do, how I want to do it, and I don't want to be responsible to anybody for it. That's young people. That's television. If you understand that, that's half the battle. Now, it's about being committed to building an audience. Well, what, does, what comes with that? You got a lot of people in the business now. They're here because they want to make money. You have no shot. Because I'm not in it for the money. I want the money. I'm going to get the money. <laughs> but I'm not in it for the money. Because that's not why I did this. I did this because I had a passion to speak my version of truth to power. To stand before the masses and say, based on the evidence facts that are out there, this is how I dissect, this is what I deduce from it, and this is how I'm moving forward because of it. And as a result, you hoped that the audience would gravitate towards you. How did that happen for me? Yeah, my authenticity might be one element. Here was the other, fearless. I wasn't scared to stand before the masses. Why? Because of my journalism background. You got people in the business today, podcasters, Broadcasters, etc. You cannot be somebody that wants the camera, and then the minute the camera goes off, you want to go run and hide. In my opinion, that's not going to be successful. For Stephen Colbert or somebody like that, that's different because he's entertaining you at night. But in the news, the sports news, or news news business, no, you can't hide. You got to be willing to stand up front and center, in the face of scrutiny, and say, all of y'all could kick rocks. <laughs> Come to me with facts or kick rocks. You got no chance against me. Because I'm bringing that to you, and I don't care what you say. So you get to a debate format, commentary, right? Well, what's the, what's the key to being a successful commentator? It's not about convincing you that I'm right. It's about you being convinced that I believe I'm right. Based on the information that I have and the facts that I'm presented, this is where I stand. I don't care what you think. Because the second I do, you can spin me. You can influence me. And if you can do that, then the audience gets to say, I don't trust you because you ain't standing on anything. That, that doesn't mean you can't admit when you're wrong in the face of facts. It doesn't mean that you have to stand on something even if it's falsehood. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if the facts are the facts and that's what you believe, pressure can't change you. The information might be able to, because as, more, as, the, as you acquire more facts, all right, that's fine. But the pressure of the audience raining venom down upon you, you got to close your umbrella and say, bring the rain. I can take it. That's what matters. You can't do that. You don't belong in this business. And there's a lot of people that are in this business. Don't blink. They'll be gone because they can't take it. On that note, well, and I would say, same for leadership. Amen. I got Amen.